Hello, welcome to Scary Thoughts, Horror, Philosophy, Culture. I'm Mark Kate, And I'm Chad Lott. This is episode 111. We're going to be talking about Soviet horror with our guest, Alexander Herbert, who recently published the book Fear Before the Fall, Horror Films in the Late Soviet Union. And that is out now on Zero Books. You can email us at what the W H A T T H E at scarythoughts.org. So, this is like a, an overview of these, I mean, I think in, from our perspective, incredibly obscure films. You know, yeah. they're, they're um, because of the, the way the state handled film during the Soviet Union, that there just wasn't a horror genre. Like, it doesn't even exist as a thing. Like, we, we get into like books and magazines and things and what exists, and there's just like nothing, which is pretty weird right because life in the soviet union was pretty dark so you'd think some horrific themes think it would, would be emerge. reflected yeah but it was not reflected and um you know there's a handful of these films and this book does a very good job of explaining where they came from and kind of what they're like a couple of them if you watch them on youtube or whatever you're like i don't know what the fuck's going on so you would need this book as sort of a guide to them i think the two best ones are v yeah uh, vii i believe or vi vi y. depending on what you're what it, anyway, V Russian horror movie, you'll find it online. Uh, and then Mr. Designer, which is like a, it's almost like Jodorowsky meets Herzog, but Russian. Uh, and that is the one I think you should look up if you're going to look up one. It's on um, YouTube. Yeah, they're bo- both of them are on YouTube. Yeah. But yeah, this is a cool guide. Normally, I'm not a huge fan of zero books, but I think this is like the kind of thing. <laughs> and that... I have a zero books tattoo, so <laughs> we are very polarized on that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like the, this is what I think is best about zero books is like introducing these insanely niche topics and, you know, having somebody who's like really geeks out on it and writes it. So uh, it, it's it's a, you know, it's a pretty quick book. It's like 116 pages or something like that. Um uh, and if you're into this podcast, you're going to be into this book. Absolutely. Yeah. And let's get to the conversation with Alexander Herbert. Alexander, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. I was happy to be here. Happy to be with you. So maybe before we dig into the book and Soviet cinema and horror, you could give us a little bit of your personal background, um, like personal, you know, your journey in punk and horror, how you got to the Soviet Union your academic background, and uh, I know you've uh, written before this book too, yeah? Yeah, uh, my, my previous book was a history of Russian and Soviet punk rock or punk rock in the Soviet Union and Russia, and that was an oral history. That was sort of like a, a labor of love of five years of interviewing that um, that culminated in, in a book that spanned from roughly like 1978 to 2015. Um, but I am primarily a historian of uh, the Soviet Union in modern Europe, particularly I do environmental history, which is kind of a newer form of, of history that a lot of people haven't heard about. Um, but in general, I focus on the later period of the Soviet Union. And uh, I'll be defending my dissertation in March. So uh, actually in like two weeks on like March 8th. So yeah, that's what I do. I also run a leftist community library in Providence. It's called Red Ink Community Library. It is a lending library. It's like a physical library. It's not, you know, one of those cool boxes outside of a house or something like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Which like I love those, don't get me wrong. But sure, it sure. Is, like I'm just trying to paint an image. It's a it's a walk-in library. You can become a member. Uh, we made the news uh, a year ago because there was a whole gang of neo-Nazis that showed up during our reading of the Communist Manifesto. So I do that. And I'm also a member of the Communist Party Club of Rhode Island here. So I'm, I'm active in a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I'm sorry, which school are you doing your dissertation at? My dissertation is out of Brandeis University. Oh, great. Oh, cool. Congrats. Good luck. I hope you fucking win, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm 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 not particularly nervous about it. Everyone's like, "Are you preparing?" And I'm like, "No, not really. Like, I probably really won't until like two or three days out." Because you know, you spend so long writing a dissertation that like it just kind of becomes second nature to you. So that when people ask you questions about it, you kind of know it like the back of your hand already. So for me, it doesn't take that much prep work. But thank you both. 
Yeah, we. I, I listened to another podcast that you were on. You you mentioned briefly that your PhD was focused on like the environmental impact of like a dam or maybe dams. Yeah, so my dissertation is on what's called the Leningrad flood protection barrier. It's this massive. It's actually made up of multiple dams, culverts, and and sluice gates, and it cuts across the Neva Bay in the Gulf of Finland, where the two bodies of water meet. It is the largest structure that crosses a body of water. It's 25.4 kilometers. So it's massive. It's huge. And it was, they, they began construction on it in 1979. But of course, it was like a project that they had been devising and, and experimenting with throughout the entire Soviet period, practically. So my dissertation begins with a cataclysmic flood in 1924 in Leningrad that absolutely decimates the city. And it lets the party realize that we have to do something about flooding in the city that is literally uh, built on a swamp. Um, And so it begins the process of investigating forms of flood control. So it's a commentary on Soviet power, power in relationship to water control, it's a commentary on Soviet science and technology. Uh, and in the 1980s, when there is a social reaction to the construction of the dam, it's also a commentary on the emergence of Soviet environmentalism and green politics. Cool. Well, I would love to rewind and maybe talk a bit about your background before you got invested so directly in Soviet history. To when you were maybe, I'm kind of presuming, a punk kid watching horror movies at home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what's that story? You know, I, when I was a child, I used to go to my dad's house, you know, like every weekend. And uh, we would just go to the local rental movie store, movie rental store. And um, he was pretty lax with what we chose. And so, you know, my brother and I would choose horror movies because those always have the coolest looking covers yep and so we just we would watch them and spend all weekend just watching things that i was probably too young to watch but i loved anyway and i uh looking back on it i think it's a great thing and i just developed a fascination for the genre itself and that that existed independent of uh, interest in either punk or Russia and the Soviet Union. And it wasn't until like I got a little older, like around 15, 16, 17, where I realized that there actually is a lot of intersection between punk and horror. If you think of like the Tromaville films, yeah, there's a lot of like punk actors that Lloyd Kaufman em- employed, or I don't know, employed, but put to use in the films. And, you know, the soundtrack for a lot of these films, like there's a, what is that one film, uh, Terror Vision, I think, where like one of the characters is a metalhead and he's wearing like a wasp shirt. It just that you sort of the older I got, the more I realized that these these two worlds are sort of the, are, are similar. And within punk rock, there has also been uh, this commitment to broadly left politics, whether that's anarchism or um, or whatever. And broadly left, I'll say. And so I've always been like politically radical ever since I can remember, even as a kid, when I was too young to know what mind the gap meant, I was still really into, into uh, political themes. And so, and the fact that my grandfather, his family was Polish, I just developed an interest in the Soviet Union. I really wanted to learn Polish, but the school that I went to didn't offer Polish as a, a language to study, but they offered Russian. And so I started studying Russian. And then I lived in Russia in uh, 2012 to study the language. And I've been back there pretty much every other year since 2012, except for the past. Actually, no. Yeah, I've been there every other year since 2012. Oh, wow. And there's so many branches of, of punk in its history that have a lot of different vectors around different kinds of politics. So what bands sort of introduced you to certain ways of thinking about politics? 
for me, the biggest influence was anti flag even when I was like maybe 14 or 15 or something. And then the unseen is another band that is from Boston where I'm the area that I'm from. So I got into them naturally. And, you know, I was never really like a big fan of crass, but I still, it was one of those bands that I still paid attention to the lyrics and wanted to understand what it all meant. So for me, it was always like, you know, I would hear these bands sing songs uh, about certain things. And I would look up like who the hell is Mumia Abu Jamal, for example, because I, you know, I was like 13, 14 and had no idea who these people were singing about, but I wanted to. It's sort of the the common thirst for knowledge growing up in suburban Massachusetts and fucking bored out of your mind, you know? Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. A, a second ago, you mentioned like the the sort of like broad left bent of like horror movies. And, I, you know, I was thinking about that. And um, it, there's really like kind of like an er, in early horror, it's like a very anti-war sort of deal. You know, like you get a lot of, you know, all the nuclear analogs, like the giant ants and all that shit in the 50s. But then later, like the 70s guys are all coming back from Vietnam, like Tom Savini. You know, the reason why his effects makeups was so good is he had just seen so many people killed. Yeah. And then those dudes were definitely like, you know, they were like fellow traveler weirdos, you know, like a lot of those early guys. I, you watched like Sam Raimi wearing like, you know, band t-shirts and stuff like that, like in like behind the scenes shit. It's just cool to see that. It, I guess it's been like that forever for since the jump, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the connection is. It wasn't always so evident for me, but uh, the older I got, the more that I, the more I saw it. And, you know, punk is sort of the avenue through which I got into environmental history as well, because in Russia, as in the United States, you know, if you talk to any of those guys from the ELF or anything like that, they all grew up listening to punk rock as well. Mm. So like histories of, of environmental activism, horror, all of that stuff, punk rock is enmeshed in it all. And so when I started studying Russia and the Soviet Union, I was initially interested in the imperial period. But after a while, but you, you know, I still am. But like after a while, I just kind of lost relevance with it because the world was changing so rapidly. And, you know, climate change is a big anxiety for me that uh, as it should be for everybody that uh, I, I couldn't justify studying a guy from 1812 anymore. You know, I I had to bring it to the present and I wanted to, and also thinking kind of ahead of myself as as being a teacher, as being an educator, I also wanted to humanize the Soviet Union in a way that I feel like a lot of academic pedagogy doesn't do. You know, like you can read an entire book about nationalities policy in the Soviet Union but you look like as an American that's just broadly interested in Russian history, you can't really relate to that all that much unless you have a great professor who's capable and willing to do that. But if you're if you're like interested in punk rock or in horror films, there's ways to analyze Soviet history and the problems of Soviet culture and society through the things that interest you on a personal individual level. Uh, so that's sort of been my behind the scenes project behind the scenes being like behind my dissertation through mm. through this book on horror and through the punk rock uh, book one of the questions i wanted to ask about these movies and like as you came to write this book is what's like the the russian perspective on these films are these like finally remembered like oh these are like evil dead of russia or are they minor films? Like, like if you ran into like a, like a regular person or even like a punk rock or like how would these particular films be thought of? I mean, V, for example, is one that is pretty fondly remembered. It really depends. I mean, because the genre, the genre doesn't officially exist in, in the Soviet world um, until the 80s. But V is remembered mostly because of the people that are involved in making it. Alexander Petushko, for example, is like a, was like considered the Walt Disney of the Soviet Union because he fil- he did mostly uh, fairy tale films and he had these magnificent sets that are like extremely memorable. There are other films like like Bloodsuckers from 1991 who that are also is also a fondly remembered film. And then you know 
in Russia, probably not so much, but at least in Belarus, the uh, King Stocks Wild Hunt is one that that is remembered mostly because the the original story is is one of Belarusian nationalism. Uh, so whether or not people agree with with it or not, it's still it's fondly remembered as a an ode, I guess, to to Belarus. But for the most part, like Vampire Family and Veld, for example, it's not really that fondly remembered. It's unfortunate because the the Vampire Family is a really great film. It's just poorly directed on bad film, so it's it's sort of hard to watch because it was kind of low budget and it was uh, financed mostly by an anti AIDS by like an AIDS protection organization, which didn't have that much money, unfortunately, in the '90s because uh, the the state was bankrupt at that point. But like Mr. Designer is another one that is kind of heralded as a progenitor, I guess, of like Soviet horror itself. Yeah, it depends on which film, really. And, and my choice for which films to study were more so based on the my own choice. You know, it was the the films that I thought were the most interesting, the most diverse, and the and the films that said the most. What's your impression on why these films haven't been? Criterion channelized. Um, it seems like every fucking horror movie from every era has had three DVD re-releases in the last yeah. 30 years or 20 years, but not these films for some reason. And the ones that are on YouTube, I think, are really interesting looking. The ones that I've only been able to see stills from, I really would love to see. And it sort of surprises me that these haven't made their way into um restoration and translation i don't have like a direct answer for that uh, because i don't know what's going through the minds of the criterion or shutter people like v for example is on shutter yeah the last time i checked that film in so many ways is the exception to all of the films in this book it people in the west even know that film because it's it's an amazing film yeah i'd seen it twice before i'd even come across your book yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, that, but, you know, another reason is especially uh, the films from the 90s. So that is like the last three chapters of the book. I think that there are still questions about ownership because at that point, the film industry is being privatized. And so as opposed to V, which is owned by Moss Film, which is completely gutted in the collapse of the Soviet Union in all of the the films of the Moss film canon are made open access. So, you know, there's no question about copyright. You can kind of put them anywhere. The other films, I think it gets a little shakier. They belong to different studios as opposed to the, the state run studios. I also think that like some of, some of the films just had a low budget. And so the, even in, even in restoring them, the technology used to, to film them, I'm not sure how much it would improve the visual quality of it if they restored it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think like, though, like some of it, it's a neat effect. Like Mr. Designer, I think just have like, has like a, like an almost eyes wide shut dreamscape look because of the fuzziness yeah. of the film. And like, to me, that's the one I would like champion for having a revival. Yeah. They, I agree with you on that. They, they definitely should uh, revive that one. And it's a really good film too. And it's, it's directed really well. As well. I don't know if it's the white suit or what, but like it just made me think of like there's like something like Herzogian about it, <laughs> like or maybe yeah. just because that guy has like a little bit of a Klaus Kinski look to him, or the the act, lead actor. It's the musical score. It's the vibe. Yeah, it's the white suit. It's like it plays with colors a lot. There's some like black and white scenes from it, but the 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 message itself about like humans acting as God, I think, is palpable in so many ways. But yeah, that. That is another one that's kind of an exception because it was done so well that it should, I agree with you, it, it, it is probably my, my leading candidate for, for a republication. So I'm also curious about, um, you know, we were talking about punk earlier, and obviously music was moving across the borders from America, from the UK, all over the world, into the Soviet Union. 
And then the Soviet Union uh, uh, musicians were able to pick that up and make their own version of a lot of genres. How much was that happening in cinema? These Soviet horror movies, how much were they informed by, in particular, American horror movies? That's a good question. Again, that's a hard one to to really get at because it's it's difficult to know how much exposure to horror the directors themselves had. So what you get in a lot of these films, particularly in the 90s, I mean, so there, there's an argument to be made that V, Kingstock's Wild Hunt, and Mr. Designer were not directed consciously as horror films. They present themselves as horror films. They there's certainly a horror theme in them, but you know, the argument has been made that because Petushko, for example, considered V to be a fairy tale film, it's not a horror film. But once you get into the 90s, uh, 1990, 1991, 1992, it's clear that like Soviet directors, especially because a lot of them are young, have been exposed in some form or another to horror films from the West. And so there's a lot of like cliches that they try to do, like jump scares and stuff like that. But it's all very amateurish. It's not really done that well. And it's not done that well because they they don't have the right pairing between the the directing style and the music, for example. They don't have mm-hmm. the right kind of acting reactions to to the things that they're trying to elicit. Uh, so it's it's almost like it's somebody's uh, college project. You know, I, like, yeah. all the mistakes there are, are, are there. I wonder, like, I, was, I sent Mark an article about this earlier, but a, a guy I work with is, uh, he, he's from Moscow, and he moved here in, like, the 80s. And he told me about how they used to go see movies. They would just basically go out to these vans, and the vans would have, like, dubs of, like, whatever American movies. And they would, like, sit in or near the van, and, like, but, like, the dialogue was done by, like, one person just sort of, like, ad-libbing it over. Right. So I imagine, like, if you never actually heard those movies... Or, or saw them in some compromised format, like you're not going to like the Megaplex Theater in Russia to see, you know, Poltergeist. Like it, it probably gets such a weird experience of it. You also had like very little theory about horror films because seeing as the genre didn't exist in the Soviet Union, there was no need to translate Western, whether, you know, German or English language texts on horror montage, for example, or anything like that. So by the time the the Soviet Union is is sort of on its deathbed in the late 80s and early 90s there's like this rush to try to understand this genre that hadn't existed for so long that like people are experimenting which in some ways is what makes in my opinion a film like Fear of the Vampire Family really interesting cuz like I really like that film I love it a lot and it's based on a Alexei Tolstoy short story that I equally love and admire but again it's just using a lot of cliches and uh, taboos from horror that are not really executed all that well but you're rooting for them i guess you want it to be better than it is are all of the movies that you cover in your book based on short stories and fairy tales previously existing content uh yes except for the concluding chapter which deals with two werewolf movies but every every other film is based on uh, either a short story or a novel there could be a few reasons for that one of them is that for soviet directors or or would-be directors it's easier to get approval from uh the censors and from the film guild i guess to make a movie that's based on a novel that already exists because it's less work on their part. And also these are stories that Soviet people already are familiar with. And so it's easier to get to pique the public's interest in the film. I think America is going through a very similar thing, but for very different reasons. Yeah. America right now is going through this weird, like recreating horror films that were made like 40 years ago right now, or like, sequels to films that were made like 30 years ago that like you're kind of yep i mean it's still there's still an approval process and it also has to do with consumers being hungry for it yeah i i read that tarantino cinema speculation book pretty recently 
and he, somewhere in there he like somebody gets advice from Tom Cruise about how to deal with like the MPAA rating and basically like they they just turn in a more extreme version of the film first and like just have all this crazy shit in it and more cursing and then they take it in there and they're like okay well, we'll take out like 40% and they cut it down to what they want it to be and then that's like how it goes like yeah. it's, it, I feel like there's like probably so much of that stuff like there's a there's a really silly a uh, movie about uh, an American baseball coach going to Russia that came out in the early '90s, and it uh, one of the subplots is basically follows. F- fuck, I cannot remember what the. It's such a dumb movie. Like I, I doubt you've run across it in your Soviet history studies, uh, <laughs> but uh, but it, it's basically all about like just like the negotiations that happen at the bureaucratic level to get stuff done. Uh, Mm -hmm. which I think like that was something that was really fascinating to me when you would hear it, like on the nightly news, they would talk about the perestroika era and how like people were, there was like the black market for blue jeans sounded so crazy to me, you know, but I guess it it was real. I was wondering if you could just frame for us, what was the policy and standards um, that prevented horror cinema from existing holy in the Soviet Union? That's also a really good question, and it's important. And it kind of explains, it it seeks to explain why horror as a genre just doesn't exist or is not recognized. And and part of it is the ideological uh, struggle against bourgeois decadence, Um, especially, you know, you have the era of socialist realism where where all forms of art have to uh, directly apply to the condition of workers or the reality of workers. And for a state whose doctrine is uh, inherently atheistic, it doesn't make sense to to entertain ideas about the paranormal and the afterlife because that stuff doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Um, And in 1970, the uh, film dictionary in the Soviet Union defines horror as leading away from the real problems of reality generating moods of hopelessness and fear and contributing to the emergence of cruelty. Just like Mark's music. <laughs> <laughs> so all, all of these elements, the Soviet Union is, of course, trying to avoid um, and not uh, raise in their people. They're, they're trying to create, a, of course, a new Soviet person that is none of these things. And they just think that horror films don't contribute any educational value or any value towards rearing an effective socialist person comrade you know when i was reading your book i was like that makes so much sense you know the supernatural being sort of like yeah it's not real so why are you afraid of it but what i was thought about though is like it seems like you could do like hitchcockian horror thrillers where like the the villain had some sort of like decadent decadent Western perspective or, or something like that. Like it, it it's really surprising to me that like some sort of like other form of horror that wasn't supernatural arose. You know you know what I mean? Like that that mode wouldn't have been used at all. Like other than supernatural bands. You know. Yeah, I I think that like horror as a genre requires death in some way Mm -hmm. whether it's like you know a serial killer or supernatural being that's causing death or whatever it is and i think that 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 kind of arbitrary execution is what the soviet union was trying to avoid depicting to its people Mm. violence for violence's sake despite you know what what we as americans learn about the soviet union and and the purges and the executions and blah 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 i think that publicly the Soviet Union just didn't want to to advertise um, violence or didn't want to entertain it. So like the, the genres that were really popular in the Soviet Union were like a historical fiction, for example, love stories about soldiers and stuff like that, um, really inspiring redemptive stories rather than the sad uh, horror-esque stories that, that uh, emerge. With the exception of V. Again, V is, is always the exception for some reason. But the, but even the end of V is left up for interpretation. Like, did this really happen or is it just, you know, the ramblings of some seminarian? <laughs> yeah. 
All right. And so remind me what the time frame that your book covers. So the cinema from between and until. Yeah. So V comes out in 1967, and that is effectively the first chapter of the book. And the the conclusion ends with the film from 1992, 1991. So, so that's the time frame. Although the introduction talks about horror films before the revolution, you know, because like horror as a genre, as you both know, like exists is pretty much as old as cinematography itself. It's as old as films itself, pretty much. And so Russia, Imperial Russia had experimented with darker stories on film. And but you know, that's just by way of an introduction. The real the first chapter starts in 1967. And then what happens? You know, after the wall falls, after everything shifts for the Soviet Union, what happens to horror in the countries of the former Soviet Union? Well, I mean, I I can mostly speak uh, on behalf of Russia in this case, but in all countries, really, it becomes at least a recognized genre. Uh, so, like, since then, the Russian Federation has made plenty of horror movies. They've even made a remake of V. I think that was in like two thousand four. Yeah. yeah, it's really bad. It's really bad. It's a terrible film. R- Russian cinema today, in general, is is really bad. There are there are some exceptions that come out here and there, but for the most part, you know the 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 films that come out now in Russia, the popular films that come out now in Russia, are really poorly made, um, bad graphics and everything. So there is sort of like a decline. You see, like in the in the late eighties and in the very very early nineties, you see like young directors really experimenting with the genre, and it seems like a kind of a fresh take. That's different than the saturated, by that time, already saturated, like Western horror genre, which is getting, it's kind of, in the West, it's the transition to the 90s is kind of getting over the campy 80s and entering into like a new kind of like jump scare phase. And in Russia, in the early 90s, you have to imagine young directors soaking all of this stuff up, soaking up the stuff that they had missed in the 70s and 80s, and then trying to also incorporate what's going on in Western horror films in the nine in the 90s. By the time the Soviet Union disappears, I think there's a decline. Part of the reason is because all the states of the former Soviet Union just become utterly bankrupt financially. Uh, and so there's the the states can no longer invest in in creating films and now uh, all the the film productions have to be farmed out to private producing companies which there just aren't enough of them to do it and it's not until after Yeltsin and probably after Putin's first term where russian movies start to get made with like decent russian movies start to get made again but i think now Russia is going through, like, I don't know, a weird new sort of campiness where CGI is like, you know, supreme. I don't understand it, but (laughs) yeah. Was there anything like a a horror comic? You know, like in America, I think one of the things that like helped ferry American horror along was like EC Comics. And, you know, I I got to thinking about that because, you know, like one of these movies is based on a Ray Bradbury story and there were tons of like EC Comics, right? Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury, but is there like is is the state also banning like horror novels? Is that is that is that happening as well? Yeah, in general. So when I say horror as a genre in the Soviet case, I mean literary and film as well. And so mm-hmm. there are there are strict censorships on what gets published through the writers, essentially guild and the film guild as well and 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 horror is just one of those taboo genres that isn't really accepted in any form really not even in like pictorial art there is this brief movement that happens in the 80s called necro realism but it's not really horror instead it's it deals mostly with the reality of death uh so there's this there's like a famous 
shot in a, in a necro. It's very amateurish, but there's a there's a famous shot in a necro realist film of like a decaying body or however the directors imagine a decaying body to be. But it's not really scary. It's more it's like applying socialist realism to death and saying that, you know, recognizing that death is inevitable is something that we have to accept. And this is what it looks like. And it can be it can be an absurd thing. Um, so it's like blending absurdism with socialist realism through death, but it's not really horror films. And it had a kind of like a youth movement pop up with it, right? Like th- there's like a the scene sort of associated to that. Yes, it is very much embedded with the early punk scene uh, in the Soviet Union. It's the same people, essentially, at least from my mind, through my research. One of the founders of necro realism, this uh, person Yevgeny Yufit is supposedly the same person who empowered the first, the quote unquote first punk of Soviet Union to create a punk band, Svin, from the band Automatichiski Udovletvuritlni or the Automatic Satisfiers. So it's the same person. They're all in Leningrad together, just, you know, like I was when I was 14, being a bored suburban kid, you know. With access to a city. So that seems to be like the little I read about it. It feels almost like the New York hardcore scene in the early 80s. Like it was very like super feral. The normies definitely weren't into it. You know, is is that accurate? Like, because I mean, there's almost nothing about it. Like, I think Mark was hoping this would be like your next book. I want to know so much more about necrorealism. It just reminds me of like a lot of the material actionists in Vienna and, Mm -hmm. you know, Coom Transmission, Throbbing Gristle and industrial culture, both in the UK and here. Yeah, I had the opportunity to interview Evgeny Yufit before he died, but that was for the the punk book. He passed away now, so I I don't have access to interviewing him for a book on necrorealism. I don't really have much more i mean yeah they are they are a a pretty eclectic group of of uh kids in leningrad and they they're relatively bourgeois like in soviet standards they're like sven's family for example his dad lives in israel and his mother is a, a a famous ballerina uh or um yeah ballet which gives him access to music equipment you know, that other, the other kids might not have. Um, the same thing with Ufit. Like he has access to video cameras that they can, you know, you can imagine at being a teenager and your friend gets a video camera and you're like, all right, let's like film some shit together. What do we want to film? Let's film something about death because that's cool because we're edgy kids. Uh, and so they just, they experiment in these, in these cool ways and, and eventually establish a, a sort of genre around it. Are there any American b- punk bands that like punks over there are like particularly hot on? In the Soviet period or in general? Just in general, I guess more like more about now, like the time you were over there or because, you know, during the Soviet period, like, like um, I think I'm probably a bit older than you. We had the Moscow Music Peace Festival and we shipped all of our terrible hair metal bands over there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I like Skid Row. <laughs> we, we, we roll alone. Man, that whole thing, I like it was well, so didn't amazing. the Scorpions essentially end the Soviet Union single handedly with wind well, of change? There, well, there's they, that CIA <laughs> theory, conspiracy theory out there. So that, good. It's so silly. Uh, no, it's I, not. It's beautiful. I, I, we'll just pretend it's real. But like, <laughs> there is some, there is, I mean, you know, not to interrupt, but there is some, I don't know if it's CIA, but there is some truth that like these cultural exchanges expose Soviet youth to a culture that they didn't have access to. And it got them thinking like, why don't we have Skid Row, for example? And it made them resentful in a way to the Soviet state. I mean, if you had never seen it, like a hundred thousand people went to that concert, you know? And like, if you had never seen, like, you know, Dr. Feelgood era Motley Crue before, it'd probably blow your mind, uh, you know? Exactly, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's something that I think Westerners don't realize is, in order to hate Motley Crue, you have to have at least seen Motley Crue first. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, 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 right. You have I to mean, at least know what they are. Look, and I read the dirt, so I, I'm I'm on board with you know Motley Crue discourse globally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but, but I mean, no, any particular, like, I, I just imagine, like, the misfits are just everywhere in my mind, you know? No, yeah, actually, not so much. In in the Soviet period, it's definitely the Sex Pistols. Oh, interesting. Just because it's the easiest to listen to through intercepted BBC radio, and they were everywhere in uh, 77 and 78. So um, the Sex Pistols definitely in the, in the 70s. Actually, the name, the Automatic Satisfiers, is a play on the term Sex Pistols directly. So good. So the 90s is sort of this massive rush of new music that Russians are being exposed to, like across the board. All this new stuff is just flowing into uh, the Russian Federation through Westerners that are coming into Russia, through bands from the West that finally have access to playing in Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of the, I don't, I don't know if I can, hmm. It's not really at that point. It's not even really like '80s hardcore that makes its way into into Russia at that point. It's kind of like uh, all of that '77 experimental slash new wave CBGB era type stuff becomes really influential for in the early '90s, and then by the by like the mid to late '90s, it's like Green Day and uh, the Offspring and all of those. So. In the punk book, that's what I call the Moscow Giants because Moscow is like the real first city in Russia that really tries to commercialize punk rock. And they do that with bands like uh, Terakani and Naive that are like the, the Russian equivalents to Green Day. It even sound like them, like musically. And then by the 2000s, people have access to like mail order catalogs and stuff like that. And they have heard 80s hardcore and the hardcore scene really emerges in Russia. It blows up in the 2000s, really. Moving even later than that, like how, like is Pussy Riot considered like a punk band there? Like I know in America, we that's kind of how we think of them. But like, are they part of that emergent scene or like how? Oh, not, not, not at all. In fact, yeah. I, I asked, you know, I asked most of my interviewees what they thought about Pussy Riot, most of the younger interviewees, what they thought mm. about Pussy Riot. And, you know, a lot of them didn't really have anything to say. Some of them thought that Pussy Riot was a conspiracy because they, like, they did their protests and then they went to jail and then they came out of jail with these BMWs and fancy houses and owning right. fire and all that stuff. There were other more commercial punk bands in Russia who recognized and appreciated their, like, political courage. I guess kind of envied it in a way, but you know, how much of that is this person just trying to sound like a quote unquote ally and how much of it is genuine admiration for them? I don't know. But in general, everybody that I talked to were like, no, we've never seen these women before. We have no idea who they are. They like, they never went to shows or anything. They're just, and I don't think that Pussy Riot would like necessarily hide that fact either because they mm -hmm. consider themselves to be artists, first of all, abstract artists and their music isn't even really punk rock either at least like i don't know how, depending on how you want to define the genre yeah that makes a lot of sense actually have you heard of a, an american hip-hop band called the suicide boys yeah yeah it, i ran across i kept seeing their name in the comments of v i guess they use like an image from the movie as an album cover or something like that oh weird yeah, yeah so it, there's um the the band torso from oakland yeah, from the Bay Area. I'm not sure if it's Oakland, but there, one of their shirts is an image from V as well. Wow, oh, I'm proud of Oakland. It's a great looking movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the the Russian punk scene is is amazing now. Although, like now since the war started, at least in Saint Petersburg, where I spend most of my time, a lot of the people that were involved in running and playing in underground punk venues, they've all fled Russia because they don't want to get conscripted and so there's this new phenomenon going on that like people really want me to research which is all of these russian punk musicians have fled to georgia to tbilisi and they've created their a punk scene in georgia for the first time which is very very interesting but i just don't have the money to get to georgia and it's like it'd be really easy to research because it's all people that i met before and people that i consider friends now I just don't have the money to get there. So, no, oh, it does sound totally interesting.
Yeah. Go cool. fund me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should, man. I'm sure somebody, <laughs> I mean, like, it's like the musical migration is super interesting, you know, right. like as, as a phenomenon, just all over the world, you know? We went to go see this band, Ma- Mdu Maktar, which are these like, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but it's like a desert psych rock band, you know? And then, you know, these dudes are like out in, out in the middle of nowhere wearing basically robes and shit like nomads and somebody gives them a a copy a tape copy of purple haze and now there's like this whole new style of music that exists yeah and it's a i mean to a lot of in in many senses that's kind of what happens in in russia too is you know somebody gets their hands on a sex pistols tape or lp and they're like let's emulate this as much as we can yeah, is it Russia that has that tradition of using X-rays to make records? Yeah, that's yeah. in like the that's in like the the late fifties and sixties. The the Stilyagi subculture, which is like the the predecessor of punk rock, I guess it's like hit, they call it like Stilyagi is a translation of hipster because in the literal sense, not in like the two thousand twenty three sense, they are people that are hip that are like in tune with with world culture and stuff like that. Like us. No. Like, exactly like us. <laughs> exactly um, like us. <laughs> um, I guess, you, you know, we've gone, used a lot of your time, but, but another kind of set of questions I have is just like with zero books, like our buddy Daniel Coffeen has I like I think it might be our third zero books. Second. Second, oh, okay. Yeah. Right. You know, and like we've followed them for a while and like they always have like these banger titles and good covers <laughs> and <laughs> your book is no exception. And I'm just wondering, like, like, do you bring them, like, the outline? Like, how do you get something like this into the world? Yeah, I brought them the outline of the book. It was sort of like a book pitch. Uh, and they operate through John Hunt Publishing, which is out of the UK. And the, my first book was published through Microcosm in Portland, which, like, operated in a totally different way. I sent Microcosm a book pitch. They accepted it. And then they were like, all right, when you're done with the draft of the manuscript, send it, we'll edit it, and then, you know, do the formatting and blah, blah, blah. And it was like very much back and forth emails. Whereas with John Hunt, with zero books, it's like you make the pitch, you send it to them, you have a draft, and everything is done on this like online interface. So there's no emails going back and forth. There's no like... You know, I kept trying to break that. I was like, fuck this interface. I just want to like, talk to somebody. and I, you know, I'm sure that they get that a lot. I'm sure I'm not the only person that does it. Um, but in general, like the, the interface that they do provide, it's actually kind of cool because it, it shows you in like real time how many, well, actually not in real time. I guess it updates it every two or three months, like how many copies were sold, how many were made. It's where you can upload all the reviews of it in the artwork and everything like that. So I understand the purpose of having this like online interface that they use. But for me, I am not very tech savvy. I feel like my my age of millennials is sort of like the the last to be able to claim that, you know, because like people who are younger than me now, it seems like everybody is like super tech savvy. Yeah. But but like, you know, those of us born in 1989, 1990 are sort of the last people that can claim, like, I don't know technology that well. I can work a computer, but like, I don't know a lot. So it was sort of hard to work with. But zero books in general have been great to work with as like promoters and stuff like that. Yeah, they, I mean, they have some like, you know, you can get a whole book on black metal ecology, you know, like it's so it, I don't know that there's a more like specific niche publisher but then they have like they all have kind of a look too which is kind of interesting you know yeah they uh so they are also extremely flexible about artwork and presentation so microcosm not so much and in fact i to this day i i'd love the artwork that the artist did for the cover of it but i don't like the concept and i don't like how much microcosm tried to like gender fluid the entire book which like i i get it you want to make a commentary about about russia and its anti-homosexual propaganda laws and yada yada but at the same time like you know there was there was a moment when i was editing the book where one of the editors at microcosm was like you need more perspective you need to interview more women 
And I was like, okay, yeah, I mean, this chapter can use more women. But the problem is that the women are going to say things that are not going to make you happy. And they were like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, you'll see, whatever. So I went back <laughs> and I like, and I interviewed some some women that were involved in the punk scene in the 90s. And sure enough, they were like, yeah, women don't belong in bands. Women shouldn't be singing. When Women shouldn't be playing instruments. A woman's role is to is to cheerlead the men that are in bands. And I put it in the book and I was like, there you go. There's your, like, <laughs> there's the perspective you wanted because Russia is just, especially in the 90s, a different culture. It's not, it's not as like, um, it's different now, of course. Now there's like plenty of uh, uh, bands with, with uh, women and trans and homosexual people, which is fine. But back then it was just different. And that generation that was like in bands in the 90s, they didn't want to, there still existed this very bifurcated and and binary, I guess, conception of gender and sexuality. But in any case, microcosm was like not that loose with that kind of stuff and with artwork and everything. Uh, they had their own in-house artist that they wanted to do a cover. And I was kind of like, OK, that's fine, whatever. But Zero Books, they like sent me a website full of graphics and they were like pick a graphic for your book and i was like how about i get like my own artist to to draw something up for the book and they were like that's fine that's cool too and i was like all right so the Great. the artwork that's done for is actually a, a local artist in providence that uh i'm a big fan of and i wanted to give them kind of bump an opportunity to like get something published in an actual publisher you know yeah it's great yeah, the expression on the like, uh, you know, this the, I guess it's a woman's face on the front is like so maniacal. It's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, that's supposed to be the witch from V. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think oh, she did a great job, and uh, it looks good. It came out really well. So. Yeah. One thing about the book that is really cool to me overall is that. You know, for someone like me who's been like digging through record stores and video stores my entire life and always, I feel like I've spent my whole life trying to find cool, interesting, unique things. And sometimes it feels like, well, I think I've heard and seen everything. Like, I don't, I don't think the world has any more surprises for me. So it's so cool to pick up this book and see that like it, it had never occurred to me. Like, oh yeah, horror in the Soviet Union. There's something there. There's something yeah. worth looking into that was so completely not on my radar. Yeah. So it was exciting to exciting to, you know, thank you for like introducing us to this this part of horror cinema history. Yeah, uh I guess you're welcome, but thanks thanks for the, <laughs> thanks for the the compliments. I mean, the same thing happened to me too. I I was like years into studying Russia and the Soviet Union and I didn't realize that there was that this genre even existed there. I knew about V like pretty early on. But again, like I said, a lot of people don't consider it to be a horror film because it's it was technically categorized as as folktale and fantasy. And so it wasn't until like I did my own research into it and I was like, okay, this this was a genre. Not only was it a genre, but like it's a very, it's a genre that is saying a lot of things about culture and society in the Soviet Union. The films that come out that I talk about are very, very specific to their time. And that is sort of what I wanted to convey, at least through the, the interpretations of the films. Because like each chapter gives like a summary, you know, the narrative and it relates it to what the story is. But then there's a section where I'm trying to interpret it in historical context. And I think that those are the real important parts of each chapter. Yeah. And the parts that hopefully are applicable or hopefully useful for people that are trying to understand nationalities in Belarus and, and nationalism in the 70s, the late 70s, or consumerism in the late 60s, or fear of uh, contamination and environmental disaster in the 80s, or, or even transformation in the 90s, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I have really any more questions about the book. I mean, yeah, other than we, I guess we could keep heaping praise on it and <laughs> tell our, you know, if you're listening to this, you made it this far, you should probably go buy this book. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks so much. Great talking to you. Yeah. Good luck with the book. I hope you crush the dissertation. Yeah. Thank you. All All right. right. Thanks again. Great talking with you. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Good night.